sort it out the tech. Um, I have with great pleasure. Oh, I'm here to introduce Dylan Muir. Dylan is a true uh, interdisciplinary persona all in himself. He has a background in electronics, computer science, neuroscience, uh, and, and in his postdocs, he already combined neuroscience with machine learning technology. Um, right now, he's a senior director at Synsense, which used to be AI Cortex for, for those who didn't make the connection yet. And he's going to talk uh, today about uh, to us about machine learning with spiking neural networks for low power inference and neuromorphic hardware. Dylan, thank you very much for being here. Go ahead. Thanks. Thanks very much, Sander. Can you hear me? Perfect. Great. Yeah. Thanks very much for the introduction. Uh, as Sander mentioned, I, I have a, a background originally in uh, uh, electronic engineering and computer science uh, in Australia. Um, I did a little bit of work in uh, artificial neural networks, after which I moved to Switzerland uh, to do a PhD in computational neuroscience. Uh, I worked in academia for a few years in, in a series of experimental neuroscience labs and then joined uh, Synsense in 2018 uh, to, to co-lead the machine learning algorithms team at Synsense. Um, so I'm really looking forward to having a chat with you guys today uh, about what we do at Synsense. Uh, we are a, a, a hardware company, uh, a, a startup based in Zurich. We have offices also in, in Chengdu and Shanghai now. Um, we make low power spiking neural network neuromorphic processes for, for real time sensory processing. So uh, where we see our processes uh, being incorporated is in uh, smart sensors, neuromorphic smart sensors. Uh, by smart sensors, I mean devices that are very opinionated about the things that they're interested in, very selective. Uh, for example, a, a microphone that's sensitive only to human voice or uh, selective only for particular sounds. Uh, so where, for example, the, the, uh, the input bandwidth to this sensor could be very high, continuous audio, continuous vision, but the output of this sensor would be extremely sparse, um, extremely selective, uh, very low bandwidth, but highly informative. Uh, so smart condition detection, for example, um, or keyword spotting for audio or, or uh, human presence detection, uh, which ignores pets, uh, ignores cars. Um, so we see uh, we, we want to continuously monitor uh, some sensory input and provide a, a very informative signal. Uh, we want to do this using spiking neural networks. That's obviously why I'm talking with you today. Uh, so we we place our devices close as close as possible to the sensor. We want to operate uh, in real time. By real time, I mean um, less than 200 milliseconds, so human human responsivity uh, time. And we want to make use of the, the spiking neural network architectures to do this at low power, by which I mean less than a milliwatt, ideally much less than a milliwatt. Uh, so we have two main hardware families at Synsense. Uh, the first on the left is a series of general purpose spiking neural network processes. Uh, we use these for low dimensionality signals, uh, such as such as audio processing, biosignal processing. Um, this includes uh, some traditional mixed signal neuromorphic processes uh, coming out, for example, of, of the, the work of Giacomo Divery at University of Zurich, uh, as well as a, a newer digital spiking neural network processor, uh, which I'll discuss in a, a bit more detail later on. Uh, the second line of hardware on the right is designed around a, a spiking convolutional neural network core uh, designed for vision processing. Uh, we've integrated that with a uh, event-based image sensor array to produce a, a compact chip that does sensing and processing uh, on the same chip. You can see the a little prototype module there. And we're using this obviously for vision sensing applications. For example, as I mentioned before, smart presence detection uh, or behavior detection. So vision-based fall detection, uh, monitoring someone inside someone's home uh, or gesture recognition for interaction, these sorts of use cases. Um, today, I, I'll, I'll focus mostly, uh, mainly on the first case, the general purpose uh, spiking neural network processes uh, for auditory processing. Um, and uh, well, we've got a couple of presentations actually later on this week about the vision processing side of things. So I'll, I'll give you some pointers to that later on as well. So in, in both cases, our focus is really on low power, real time uh, sensory processing and interaction. Uh, but I want to emphasize that for us, biological realism is, is a non-goal. So we're, we're not trying to make hardware 
uh, or network architectures that mimic or reflect biology uh, in any deep sense. We're really trying to uh, engineer efficient artifacts and we're using the, uh, the, the, the sparseness uh, of spiking neural networks as a way to get an, an energy, uh, low energy uh, benefit there. Uh, of course, none of this work could possibly happen in a vacuum. So I, I wanna start by quickly highlighting the rest of our algorithms team at Syncense. Um, I only have a, a time to talk about a very small fraction of our work today, uh, but I've included also at the end of the talk, a few pointers to, to some additional work that we've been involved with. So I wanna start then today by showing an example of training uh, a toy spiking neural network uh, using our, our development tool chain. Um, I'm gonna talk about uh, our digital spiking neural network architecture, uh, and I'll show an example application running on our hardware. Um, but to begin with, I'll, I'll start with this, this toy task. So the, the task is as shown here, uh, I'm gonna train a spiky neural network that listens to a real-time audio signal, uh, and it produces as its output uh, an image of the bird that it's heard. Um, so this is, uh, it's, it's kind of a complex sort of toy task. Uh, it's a multi-class task. Um, it's a mixture between uh, recognition and signal generation. So the network internally has to uh, listen to the audio, classify which bird call it's listening to. Um, but then it also has to produce a, uh, an output of a different modality. Uh, so it has to produce an image encoded output. Um, so you've got this sort of cross modality mapping flavor to the task. Um, you have to produce a, a complex temporal output signal. Uh, and we need to do this with a spike in neural network, but that's operating in strictly streaming mode. So we don't, we don't provide buffered, uh, a, a buffer of input that it can analyze um, uh, across time simultaneously, but really the dynamics of the network should operate in the streaming mode over time uh, to, to solve this task. And we'll do end-to-end -end training with uh, backpropagation through time on the spiking network. So I'm going to uh, accomplish this using our open source development platform, which is called Rockpool. Uh, this is a Python-based system uh, using industry standard machine learning pipelines, uh, such as PyTorch and JAX, to enable training, uh, backpropagation-based training of spiky neural networks. We also support um, more computational neuroscience flavored backends, for example, Brian uh, and Nest for, for inference, for simulation, uh, as well as some sort of native NumPy um, uh, modules for spiking neural networks as well. Uh, in this case, I'll, I'll show a backpropagation-based training example. Uh, Rockpool supports deployment as well to our, our hardware. Uh, firstly, our, our Xylo digital spiking neural network chip um, and a and development kit, which, uh, which is available now. And we'll also soon uh, support deployment to a mixed signal development kit uh, based on, on Dynaps 2. Okay, so this task, uh, obviously, um, spiking neural networks can't process necessarily raw audio uh, intrinsically. Uh, we need to, to uh, convert this input signal into an event-based representation that can be processed by the spiking neural network. Um, this is what I'm gonna show you now is an overview of, of how we do that. Uh, we have some hardware that we've prototyped within the company uh, as an audio front end. So for, for doing precisely this encoding of uh, uh, real-time analog audio signal into a streams of events for processing, uh, for, for, for audio processing tasks with spike in neural networks. Um, this is the, the an overview of the architecture here. Again, uh, it's biological realism is a non-goal. So this isn't a cochlear model uh, in any strict sense, um, but of course it, it produces a multi-channel event encoded output. So the approach we take is um, we have our obviously our, our raw microphone uh, input and we pass this through a low noise amplifier and then we split the signal into a series of uh, bandpass filter banks. So we, we analyze the audio signal and split it into a set of uh, frequency bands um, spaced and, and tunable to cover the, the bands, frequency bands of interest in, in whatever audio input you, you're uh, wanting to use. Um, and then we perform uh, rectification and smoothing uh, so that the, uh, the, the, that each frequency band is now encoding the uh, instantaneous power in that frequency band. Then we pass this instantaneous power estimate uh, through a 
leaky integrate and fire neuron uh, to convert this into a series of events. So the result of this front end encoding system is we have a single channel audio signal that is then converted into uh, a number of um, event coded audio channels where the firing rate in each event channel encodes the instantaneous power within that particular frequency band. So if, if you have any questions, uh, please ask them in the question chat. I can't see this right now, but I'm sure Sander will jump in if there's any burning questions, um, including during the talk. If there's something which is, is not clear enough, uh, please Sander jump in and, and pull me up on that. Uh, so here's an example of what that audio encoding looks like. On top, we have the raw audio waveform. Uh, in the middle, we have a spectrogram. So here we have 12 channels in this particular case. Uh, and you can see that there's the, uh, the encoding of energy in these different frequency bands uh, um, over time. Uh, but in this case, I've chosen the frequency bands between two kilohertz to 24 kilohertz. This roughly spans the range of audio uh, for the bird calls. And at the bottom is the, uh, the, the actual individual events, which are used as input to the spiking network. So similarly for the, the target uh, output image encoding, obviously spiking neural networks can't natively produce an image. Uh, so we have to encode this image as events. The way I've chosen to do that is by encoding the, uh, the rows, each row of the image as uh, uh, in the output channels of the, of the neural network. And the columns of the images are encoded across time. So we sort of stretch out the image uh, in along one dimension over a period of time, the network should should produce this um, encode this image over a period of time. So the uh, the result is that each output neuron channel encodes uh, a component of uh, the, the pixel row and has a temporally changing signal across time that encodes the the uh, intensity of the pixels uh, along that row. Uh, so if we zoom in to a little bit more detail here. Uh, you, it might be a little clearer what I mean. So here I'm showing the encoding of two image rows, row zero and row one. Uh, and the red, green, and blue components of each pixel are split up into independent uh, event channels, zero, one, and two. So this is this is then pixel one, row one, and row two. And, uh, and then we have the image columns encoded across time. So within each little dashed box here is the encoding of one pixel. Uh, split into red, green, and blue, according to the output channels, and then encoded across time according to the intensity of each channel. So uh, the, the number of events within this particular time bin encode the red, the green, or the blue intensity of that pixel at that moment in time. Uh, so if I show an example of one of those encoded images, here at the top we have, we have uh, one target image stretched out across time, the samples uh, for this particular task are five and a bit seconds. In the middle, you can see the event raster, which is used as the target signal uh, for the for the network during training. Um, so you can see the uh, the individual pixel rows are encoded, uh, RGB encoded as individual channels uh, on the y-axis, and then the the temporal sequence of pixel intensities is encoded over time along the x-axis. And at the bottom is the is the actual uh, plotted events which are used for the target. The neuron model is a very simple, very standard uh, leaky integrate and fire neuron model. Um, I don't need to go into any sort of detail with that, uh, for the, certainly for this audience, but for completeness, I just lay out the, uh, the dynamics here. Uh, we have um, independent synaptic and membrane dynamics, uh, independent synaptic and membrane time constants. Uh, we have a bias added onto the membrane potential. The input spikes are integrated directly onto uh, the synaptic current. The output spikes are produced through the spike production function, uh, which is basically a heavy side function. Uh, I'll, I'll show that, I'll plot that in just a moment as a function of the membrane potential. And then we have a subtractive reset of the membrane potential based on the output spiking. So it's a very standard leaky integrate and fire uh, neuron. The obviously uh, for the, the purpose of, of this workshop is about how difficult it is to train spiking neural networks. And of course, one of the principal difficulties comes about through um, finding a way to get gradients uh, through the network. The, the off the shelf solution now is of course, surrogate gradient descent. Um, here's the spike generation function for this leaky integrate and fire neuron. 
uh, of course, I don't need to go into detail with this here either. Uh, but the problem is, of course, that the the, deriv the gradient of this heavy side function uh, is zero everywhere except at the threshold where it's undefined. So it's not very good for gradient descent. And uh, of course, we are not the ones to um, who have come up with the concept of surrogate gradient descent. I've got a very incomplete list here of uh, friends and family, many of whom are in the audience today, who have uh, been investigating this question for, for quite some years. Um, we use a very simple surrogate gradient function, uh, which essentially approximates the transfer function of the neuron as a, a piecewise rectified linear uh, neuron. And therefore, the the backwards and the backwards pass the surrogate gradient is uh, either zero or a constant value. So it's very very cheap to calculate. Uh, okay, the network architecture that we use for this task is shown here. Uh, in in green is this audio encoding front end that I explained previously. So the raw audio comes in uh, on the left. Then we have our twelve event channels um, which encode this in audio instantaneously. We have a set of linear weights, which are shown in blue with W, uh, and then leaky integrate and fire blocks uh, shown in orange here with LAF uh, to transform between the 12 input channels to the number of uh, hidden channels. Uh, then we have two residual blocks, which I'll explain in, in more detail on the next slide, and then another uh, set of linear weights and spiking neurons to do the final encoding for the uh, 96 output channels. This is the RGB. Um, pixel uh, rows for the, the encoded image. Uh, sorry, I, I also want to say that uh, this is strictly a streaming architecture during inference. Um, there's no time windowing. Really, these 12 input channels uh, at, at a single moment in time is the only uh, input this network is receiving during inference. Uh, during backpropagation training, we train on an entire sample. Um, uh, so uh, information from the entire sample is used to compute the gradients and used to compute the parameter, up, parameter updates. But then in the forward pass and during inference mode, uh, it's, it's purely a streaming architecture. Uh, this is a residual block. Uh, probably most of you are familiar with what a residual block is in a residual network. Uh, but basically, it's a block where uh, you have the same number of input and output channels. You can perform some internal processing in the block, but you also pass the input data uh, by completely around this block, bypassing any any information processing transformation that's taking place within the layer. Uh, so within the layer, we have a set of linear weights and uh, a set of linear, uh, sorry, leaky integrate and fire spiking neurons. Um, but then we have these n n event channels coming in, which can also bypass the layer entirely. And uh, for a spiking neural network, this is potentially very beneficial for low low latency processing. Um, so you, you can completely bypass any temporal integration which is taking place uh, due, due to the membrane and synapse dynamics within the uh, leak integrate and fire neuron layer. So what does this look like in Rockpool? Uh, here's some what, what the code looks like to generate this network. Um, we're, we're using, uh, so as I said, Rockpool is our open source tool chain for machine learning spiking neural networks. Uh, provides many standard modules, uh, many standard blocks for building and training spiking neural networks. Uh, in this particular example, I'm, I'm showing uh, uh, an example of using the JAX backend. Uh, JAX is a, uh, an open source library from Google for uh, automatic differentiation and uh, accelerated computation. Let's use GPUs, CPUs, TPUs, whatever you have available. Uh, but we have spiking torch modules available uh, equivalently for Rockpool and any standard torch module uh, you can use uh, directly in Rockpool. Uh, so here's what the code looks like. We import the linear weight layers. Uh, we import an LAF layer. We import these uh, two combinators. Sequential just builds a feed forward stack of layers. Residual implements this residual block. And here we very simply define the structure of the network uh, exactly as I showed you on the on the previous two slides. We need to uh, define a loss function for our optimization. Here is a, a minimal loss function that we would use for the uh, for the, the, the JAX training. Um, we uh, here we receive the parameters for this trial and assign them to the network. Uh, we simulate the network by passing the input data through the network and receive the, the output spike raster. 
uh, and then we compute and return a loss. In this case, um, we're using mean squared error loss, but really you, it, it's completely arbitrary. You can use any loss uh, that you can pass gradients through. So for example, cross entropy, um, CTC loss, uh, anything else, any, anything else you can think of, you can add additional regularization terms here um, in a very straightforward way. Then uh, we use this auto differentiation facilities from JAX, um, JAX.grad. For those of you who haven't seen JAX before, this simply takes your loss function and converts it into a gradient of the loss function. So you, uh, you, you for free, you get a function uh, that, that gives you the gradients of the loss with respect to all of the parameters in the network. And this is what we use then for training. Uh, so we have a very simple training loop here again, so the minimal sort of training loop. Um, where we're using Atom uh, as an optimizer in this case, uh, provided by JAX. You can use any of the standard optimizers, uh, anything that's available. You can easily write your own optimizer if you choose. Um, in this case, we use Atom. We, uh, we loop over the data. We get the parameters for this particular trial from the optimizer. We use our gradient of the loss function, which we got on the previous slide. Uh, to get the gradients for this trial. And then we use the optimizer to update the parameters for the network. And then we do that tens of thousands of times uh, to train our network. Here's what the, uh, the, the training loss looks like over time. Um, this, this example here took about one hour uh, to train. That's around 120 trials per second. Uh, I think that that's pretty um, reasonable performance for, for a network of this complexity. This is also on a, uh, on CPU uh, on a fairly old MacBook. So uh, this is this is certainly not the, the fastest performance that one can ever get out of this. Uh, it's a bit difficult to see, but they, in fact, the, the loss is still decreasing at the end of this uh, uh, 400,000 trials, uh, but the, the performance of the network at this point was satisfactory. So I, I stopped training here. Uh, and then here's the output of the network, the trained output. So on the left is, is the spike raster produced by the network in response to the, this particular audio call corresponding to the, uh, I think it's a prairie warbler, if I recall correctly. Uh, and on the right is the, is the target raster that it was after. Um, so uh, you can see that it's, it's learned the task. It hasn't learned, I didn't train it long enough to learn precise spike timing. Um, I was a bit lazy with my my image encoding. So I didn't encode the pixel intensities as some sort of Poisson rate, but I really encoded it as these kind of bunched uh, spikes. So that's that probably makes things a little bit more difficult. But uh, nevertheless, it's it's managed to learn the task. And if we look at these uh, these two particular classes, then we can see that it's it's learned the image encoding uh, for, for the, both of these classes. So obviously, I've, I've tried to make it look and sound as simple as possible. In practice, there's always more to it than that. Uh, we know empirically that spiking neural networks require a little bit of, of careful shepherding uh, during training to take care of numerical stability, for example, um, to avoid problems of vanishing, exploding gradients, to make sure that you, you have a, a network that's deployable uh, to hardware. Um, so essentially, this means adding some, some regularization and, and and taking care of, uh, of, of things during the training process. So for example, we add some regularization uh, to the weights to avoid network instability, particularly for recurrent networks. Uh, as those of you who use recurrent networks will know that's very important. Um, uh, we, we can add activity-based regularization to ensure that we have non-vanishing gradients and we, have, we, we don't have silent networks. Uh, that wasn't a, a problem for this particular use case, but we, we've seen that, that this is a very important aspect. Um, parameter constraints are uh, also very important, uh, especially, for example, when training time constants. Um, as we heard yesterday, you, ha you, you have to make sure your time constants are strictly positive, of course. Uh, in fact, in practice, we need to ensure that there's some minimum time constant to avoid numerical instability uh, during the simulating the, the neuron dynamics. So nevertheless, we can, we can use this tool chain to train all the parameters of the network. Um, what I'm showing here is the distribution of the membrane and synaptic time constants uh, after training. Uh, so the, the red dashed line is the pre-training initialization value. Uh, they were all set homogeneously to uh, 200 milliseconds for synaptic time constants and 500 milliseconds for membrane time constants. Uh, and then after training, they, they adopted um, 
a broader distribution. The spike around 100 milliseconds is exactly this uh, minimum time constant constraint that I that I mentioned previously. So this is this is our, our constraint on the time constant. Um, what I found interesting uh, as an outcome here is that the network clearly tries to make some use of very fast or instantaneous information in the signal by having very, as short time constants as possible. Uh, but it's also clearly important to have some degree of temporal integration of the signal, especially over, over fairly long durations uh, to, to make use of information across the um, uh, broader stretches of time. Okay, so uh, our goal at SynSense is to build these sorts of models and run them uh, on spiking neural network hardware, processor hardware for inference. Uh, so I want to show you uh, an example of an audio application running on, on some of our hardware. Um, I'm going to start by explaining a little bit what the hardware architecture looks like. Uh, so this is, uh, this is our Xylo uh, digital spiking neural network architecture. Uh, this, what I'm showing you here is the essentially the neuron model. Um, this is an all digital uh, synchronous digital core. Uh, it's designed to make use of the uh, weight sparsity and activity sparsity of a spiking neural network uh, for efficient computation, efficient processing. Um, this is what I'm showing here is just a single neuron. Each neuron has a 16-bit uh, integer membrane state, uh, two independent 16-bit integer synapse states. So this would allow you to, for example, have um, synapses, two synapse time constants uh, for a single neuron. Uh, both the membrane and the synapse states implement a, uh, an integer arithmetic approximation to exponential decay, which is just cheap to compute. And the processor supports a fan in uh, of uh, up to 16 input weights per synapse. When an input arrives, input event arrives to the synapse, then the weighted input is added to the synaptic state. Um, the, uh, uh, and the synaptic state is then added to the membrane state. Both synaptic states are added to the membrane state at each time step. Uh, when the membrane state is above the 16-bit threshold, then an output event is generated uh, by that neuron. So all of the events are single-bit uh, 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 spike events. The, there's, there's, no, there's no more uh, complex encoding added to the event as there is in, in some other uh, neuromorphic, recent neuromorphic processes. The, the processor core uh, has this sort of logical network architecture. Um, up to 16 input channels, uh, event encoded input channels are supported. Uh, we provide then linear input weights between those 16 input channels and the 1000 neuron uh, spiking neuron population, LAF neuron population. This hidden population supports recurrent connectivity as well as providing a set of uh, readout weights uh, between the hidden population and uh, the eight spiking output neurons, which then comprise the output channels of the chip. Uh, so this is the logical architecture of the chip. Um, you can, of course, embed and encode uh, much more complex networks um, uh, in, into this architecture for deployment, which is, which is what we do in practice. We have a development kit, an HDK available uh, for, for this, this architecture. I have one sitting on my desk here. Uh, I'm going to show you this running in just a moment. We have a, a direct interface from Rockpool uh, from Python for training, building networks, uh, for running the simulations of the networks on the device. Uh, we, Rockpool also then has a bit accurate simulation of the hardware architecture in software. Uh, so you can test your deployment in simulation uh, before really putting it on the hardware. And we, uh, we support deployment from a trained network to the chip in approximately two lines of Python, depending on how concise you, you want to be. Uh, okay, so I, I promised to show you an example application uh, running on the chip. Uh, this example application is going to be a keyword spotting task. Uh, so it's audio processing uh, temporal signal detection task. Um, obviously, we're, we're looking for a particular spoken keyword and then producing a, a detection signal uh, at the output of the network when we recognize that spoken keyword. The network architecture, uh, I'm not going to go into any detail of uh, right now uh, today because um, it, it's uh, work done by Philip Vidal and Static Sheik uh, in our team. This is hot, hot off the press, uh, freshly available as a, as a preprint. 
so all of the details are available there in the preprint. Uh, but very briefly, so the network architecture here, we use the same uh, audio to event encoding that I showed you pre for the previous example. Uh, and then we have this WaveSense architecture uh, from, from Philip and Static. So this is a, a feed-forward uh, spiking neural network architecture. It's been designed specifically for neuromorphic processes uh, and LAF neuron dynamics. And it uses the, uh, cleverly uses the time constants uh, of the synapse and membrane to implement a temporal convolution. Um, so uh, I, I'm not going to go into any more detail, but please check out this, uh, th their preprint for all of the details of that implementation. Uh, but again, the network is running strictly in streaming mode. There's no time windowing here. Uh, we have real-time audio input uh, encoded, passed through the network, and, and then we have a, uh, a single output event channel for detection when the, the keyword is detected. Okay, now I'm going to take the great risk of doing a live demo and uh, uh, cross my fingers that everything worked as it did 10 minutes before the presentation. Uh, okay, so I'm just going to start the uh, the demo architecture here. Uh, so what we've done is we we, we trained uh, a network in on the PC in simulation, uh, and then we've deployed the network uh, onto onto the hardware. Uh, so what you'll see in a moment is uh, the the uh, the real time audio, uh, which is being encoded on the PC and then passed as a stream of events to the hardware. The, uh, the the network is running in inference mode on the device, sending events back over USB uh, to the PC for visualization on the GUI here. Um, Sander, if, I assume you can see this uh, exactly what I'm saying. If you can't see a GUI with showing an audio uh, uh, waveform, then please jump in immediately and tell me. I'll try and fix that. Otherwise, I assume every. Okay. It's really good. Okay, great. Good. Great. Excellent. Good to see so obviously, what you can see is the raw audio as it streams through, and uh, also the behavior, the, the output of the network, which is currently sleeping because it hasn't heard uh, its magic keyword, which I will attempt to say now. Hey, Snips. Hey, Snips. Okay, so second time lucky. Uh, the, the network woke up when it heard the keyword and it um, selectively ignores everything else uh, that, it, that it's not interested in. So this is what I mean about having a, a, selective, uh, a selective sensor, a smart sensor. Okay, so uh, again, the, uh, the, all of the details of this network architecture and implementation are available in uh, this preprint from, uh, from Philip and Sadik, which I encourage you to go look at. Um, but we've, uh, we've deployed this onto our hardware and we achieve uh, good sensitivity um, low latency, so less than 200 millisecond uh, operation with uh, low low false alarm rates. All right, so obviously there are fewer researchers uh, in the spike and neural network field than have been available in the, in the, the ANN deep neural network field in the past years. Even though, of course, the first artificial neural networks were spiking, it's only been recently that uh, this approach, this machine learning for spiking neural network approach with supervised training has really been, been practical and started to get some focus uh, in, the, in this subfield. And so as a consequence there, there's uh, quite a few points about training spiking neural networks that we, we know are important or that we suspect might be important, but for which we don't yet have uh, analytical results. Um, for example, uh, question of initialization for spike in neural networks. So we, we know that for deep neural networks, the optimal initialization depends on the sizes of each layer, uh, the transfer functions of the network. Um, obviously, spike in neural networks have additional parameters, time constants, thresholds. Um, empirically, we know the optimization strategy makes a difference. Uh, but we don't really have much in the way of first principles results yet about what is the best initialization strategy. But uh, I know that uh, Julia is, is speaking next uh, about exactly this topic. I'm, I'm very, very much looking forward to her clearing up uh, all of those issues for us. Um, in terms of optimizers, so here we used Adam. We've also used uh, stochastic gradient descent. All of these optimizers are available uh, for use, but they're all They've all come out of the field of, of training artificial neural networks, training deep neural networks, and they're designed for those purposes. Um, obviously, the dynamics of a spiking network are more complex. 
the training problem may also have more itself more complex and more nonlinear dynamics uh, as, a, as a consequence of the other types of parameters uh, that we're trying to train with the spiking networks. So it's possible that um, the optimizers we're using are not optimal, if you like, for training spiking networks. And uh, uh, it's possible uh, certainly that, that SNN tuned optimizers might reach uh, higher performance there. Uh, for parameter constraints, I mentioned briefly previously as well, uh, most deep neural networks don't require parameter constraints during optimization uh, to, to get things working. But obviously spiking neural networks do, especially for time constants. And it's, it's not yet completely clear what is the best way to include those constraints during optimization uh, it, as, as part of a good training strategy that's tuned to spiking neural networks. Uh, so I'm looking forward to, uh, to, to this field um, coming up with good answers to these questions in the next years. Uh, okay, so obviously I, I have only had time to touch on a very tiny fraction of the work that we're doing in our team, uh, but I, I want to close out by uh, highlighting a couple of the recent publications and, and preprints uh, that we have as other other available work. Uh, so for example, we've, we've looked at methods for uh, making networks energy aware during training uh, so that you can optimize specifically for low energy consumption. Uh, this is work done by Martino, Tsien, Massimo, and Sadiq. We've, uh, in collaboration with Giacomo and Divari's group at uh, the Neuromorphic Engineering Group at University of Zurich, we've, we've looked at work for training spiking neural networks that are uh, robust to device mismatch, uh, which is a particular problem for mixed signal processes, uh, uh, memorist to crossbar arrays, as well as spiking neural network uh, neuromorphic architectures. Uh, and these issues make single shot training and then deployment to a large number of chips very difficult. So we've, we've come up with a number of methods to try and uh, address that problem. Uh, so this is work done by, by Julian, Dimitri, Sergio, uh, Giacomo and myself. We've recently looked at uh, performance of spiking convolutional neural networks uh, under adversarial input attacks. Uh, so for vision processing, uh, moving the, this adversarial input attack um, methods from uh, standard convolutional neural networks to spiking convolutional neural networks. So this is work that's done by, by Julian, Gregor, Yellen, Martino, and Sadiq. Uh, and then, so I, I've only, I haven't touched at all on the vision processing side of things today. Um, so if you're interested in vision processing, in what we are doing for vision processing, we, uh, we, we have two presentations as part of Tiny ML Asia this Friday. Uh, so implementing optic flow using our neuromorphic hardware, so using our little integrated uh, vision sensor, as well as talking about the architecture of that vision sensor and neuromorphic vision processing itself. Uh, so both of these are, are on this Friday uh, as part of Tiny ML Asia. Uh, so I, I also spoke about Rockpool mostly today, but um, we believe very strongly in, in trying to contribute our work back to the community as much as possible. Uh, so in addition to Rockpool, we have, we have two uh, other main um, open source platforms. Uh, Tonic is, is one that we've adopted just recently. Uh, we are, we're contributing strongly to this now. This is, a, a, for those of you who, who haven't heard of it, it's a, a, a tool for managing spiking data sets uh, and for data transformations and data wrangling, specifically for neuromorphic spiking uh, event encoded tasks. Uh, this is what we're using now as a as data front end for all of our applications, uh, as well as Synapse, which is another Python uh, open source library for um, training and deployment uh, for our vision processing tasks. All right, thank you very much once again. Uh, I, I appreciate the chance to talk to you all today and I, I very much look forward to answering any questions you might have. Yeah, Dylan, thank you very much. Great talk, super. Lots of questions also. So uh, we have uh, fortunately a couple of minutes left to ask questions. Uh, the, the top last question is whether you were doing the, the training on the BPTT and, and, and whether there are plans actually to do that of, of, uh, in terms of online so chip training. None of our hardware that we've produced includes on-device on training. And the reason for that is we struggle to come up with a commercial application that requires on-device training. Um, you, you have to pay a lot in terms mm -hmm. of chip area, a lot more in terms of chip complexity. Uh, obviously, the, you know, for, especially for BPTT, the memory constraints to do that are much higher than for inference, much, much higher. 
Uh, and most of the time we expect our hardware to be used for low power inference. And so we're not willing to, to sacrifice that amount of silicon, which also burns energy just, just sitting there for the most part. Um, so we're focused on uh, uh, on-chip inference. Um, having said that, our chips are reconfigurable. So they're not single purpose ASICs. Uh, you can configure uh, a spiking neural network onto the chip. That's also true for the vision processing tasks. And so it's certainly possible to have our chip in the loop, have a little bit of logic in a microprocessor on the outside and to fine tune a network, uh, fine tune the output layer. This is, this is definitely possible. Uh, that's an interesting solution, yeah. Other questions. Um, we don't have that much time. Uh, so, so Friedemann asks um, for the, about a residual block. So it, it's adding spikes. He, he's wondering whether this, um, if you add spikes to the input spike train by the residual block, does it lead to undesired side effects? I'm not sure what those undesired side effects would be. So we're essentially merging the, the output event um, event channels. So you get more spikes in the That's same correct. channel. So you have in, in input channels and in output channels. You do some processing in between, but you also pass the N input channels around and copy them into the N output channels. So that the input and output dimensionality are the same, but you've merged the unprocessed and processed events together in those output channels. Okay. Clear to me, I hope also Excellent. clear to the others. As a topic on its own, of course, the residual of links in, in spiking networks. Um, I think, yeah. Uh, one more question was was a bit more general is uh, from, from Tom Burns was, you talked about how SNNs are attractive in electronics engineering due to being low powered. From that perspective, is this mainly courtesy of sparsity? Um, if so, why are SNNs more attractive than sparse DNNs or other low powered engineering strategies? I'd be very interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, there's, there's something I, I was tempted to jump in and talk about last night, but I, I felt like I was talking too much last night anyway. Uh, so I didn't say it, but w from the DNN side, of course, there's a lot of work on, on special purpose uh, DNN accelerators, um, TPUs being being one sort of example, but, but even more specific architectures. And when I hear the engineers who are building those talking about it, they're talking about weight sparsity. They're talking about activation sparsity. They're talking about low bit depth uh, inference. They're talking binarized neural networks. And at some point, uh, they're gonna converge with us. Um, I, I, I'm very confident about that, it's, it's happening. Uh, so we have, because our community has a bit of a head start on that because we're used to thinking in this mode, whereas they're used to thinking in, in the uh, um, linear algebra with real valued numbers mode. Uh, but I do see a convergence there. Interesting. That's a cool point. Uh, I, I know some of the binary people here in Amsterdam, and I'm wondering when they will converge indeed. Um, and maybe one final question. Uh, Karim Habashi is asking, maybe I missed it, but why output a full image instead of an address that call an image from a memory? So this is regarding the task. Why are you going for this, this time rollout rather than you say, well, this is Bert. Because it's cool. <laughs> Look, I, I wanted to come up with a toy task that was also impressive, right? It's obviously, if it's classification only, that's a lot easier. Uh, if, if you just need to say it's bird A, bird B, bird C. Um, outputting a complex, learning and outputting, generating a complex temporal output signal is, is a much harder task. And so I wanted to, to try to impress you all by showing you a more difficult, uh, needlessly more complex task. Uh, it looks super impressive. So <laughs> maybe it's art okay. then that you can now <laughs> show to people spike based uh, images. Cool. Thank you very much, Dylan. Great. Thanks and, uh, very much. Thanks, everyone. Looking forward to future developments here. So I, I think we have to move in a few, in 30 seconds to the next talk. So I think I also move to that there and um, see you all in that session.